Welcome back to the Nikki Clark Radio Show on John Doe Radio out of New York City. The show is about transforming lives one story at a time. And we invite people from all walks of life to come and share their heart stories, stories of transformation. And we are here to uplift, educate, and take people to the next level. So we are so excited to invite another stellar individual who has had quite an outstanding journey. He is the author of American Criminal Justice System, Inc., Rogue Prosecutions in an Era of Mass Incarceration. Please welcome author, blog editor, and family man, Fred Egobor, to the show. How are you doing today, Fred? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, Fred, I, I know we have met indirectly for some time now through family members and friends, and I'm just so glad that everything has aligned that we can actually talk more about your journey and your book today. So let's get to it. Fred, tell us a little bit about your background leading up to publishing this outstanding book. Yeah, um, as uh, you already know, um, I have been uh, in Canada for the past 25 years, originally from Africa. Um, I moved to the U.S. in 2000. Uh, I was hired from Canada to work in the United States. And uh, while I was there, um, I, as usual, I did my job diligently, professionally, and with utmost integrity. But the last place I worked, uh, I was the nursing director there. Mm -hmm. uh, the government was investigating the CEO of the company, and uh, they called me to help them in, in their investigation. Um, I went to them, you know, without an attorney, uh, because I naively believed that if you tell the truth, you have nothing to worry about. Sure. But unknown to me, yeah, unknown to me, uh, the truth was, was not what they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got there, they wanted me to frame my story in such a way that they can build a case against the CEO of the company but which will not be a reflection on the truth. And I told them I wasn't ready to do that. And one of the agents said, well, I'm going to deal with you and make sure I send you to prison. Mm -hmm. Four months later, I was picked up and uh, kept in detention for 18 months oh my God. while awaiting trial. Wow. During the trial, um, government called about 23 witnesses because I was on trial with the medical director of the company. Of the 23 witnesses, there was no one that testified against me except the CEO of the company that I worked, for whom I was being punished, who took a plea bargain and became a government cooperating witness. So he became the only witness on the stand with knowledge of the company I worked that testified against me. During the trial, the jury was hung, and three times the judge asked them to go back and continue their deliberations. Then the government, fearing that they might lose to me, an indigent, because I didn't even have, I couldn't hire an attorney, uh, I had to use a, a court appointed attorney. The government, fearing that they could lose, wanted to release me, but with a condition that they would drop all the charges of fraud against me and that I should plead guilty to not telling them the truth. I wow. refused. I turned down the offer and stood on this, you know, side of truth. Mm -hmm. Eventually, um, the jury came with the decision. Of course, they were already exhausted from, you know, many days of deliberations and having to the judge that they couldn't reach. Uh, they had no case against me, and the judge kept insisting that they go back and continue the liberation, they eventually came with their decision that cleared me of all the fraud charges, uh, but found guilty of conspiracy based on the testimony of the CEO who claimed that I knew that he was committing fraud. So uh, I was sentenced to four years in prison. I finished my time in 2016, and I had to return back home to Canada. 
Um, what was the priest that started writing my book? Uh, I, I had a compulsion to tell my story mm-hmm. and the stories of other people who have been victimized by the American criminal justice system. To let the world know that what they call justice system there is actually an injustice system. So that is uh, a, brief, a brief background of what happened. I'll be ready to respond to further questions that may arise. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's, really, um, that's really quite uh, a journey that you, you took um, coming into a position. And then uh, it, it sounds as if you were targeted and then you were the fall guy so to speak. You know what I mean? And, That's right. Uh, and then now you're fighting for your life uh, through a system that what you're saying uh, is, is flawed. And now you're trying to um, share your experience through this book. So w- what are some of the things that you, you want us to learn from the book? And I know you said you started writing the book in, in – um, when you're in, incarcerated, how long did it take you to write it? And, and what are some of the lessons you want the readers to learn? Yes, I started writing the book while, while I was in prison, like I told you earlier. I finished it within a year. So give or take, it took me about two years to write it. And in this book, I quoted a lot of statistics. These are no statistics from activists. They are statistics from the Bureau of Prisons, and the Attorney General's office. You know, the statistics are certainly a revelation of what is going on within the uh, criminal justice system. For instance, as we speak, Nikki, 2.1 million people are currently being incarcerated in America, which is higher than the number that they had in the former Soviet Union during the era of Joseph Stalin. Even though America is only 4.3% of the world's population, 25% 25% of global prisoners are resident in America. You go to some communities, you find a child with one of both parents in prison. Lives are being ruined. Families devastated by justice system gone be sick. Then the question is, what is driving mass incarceration in America? Mm-hmm. Because of greed by the prosecutors. Most of them use the criminal justice system as a path to lucrative private practice. Then, on the other hand, we have the private prison owners. As of today, America has about 7,200 7, prisons, many of them private. And of course, the goal of a private prison owner is not you know, rehabilitation or correction. Their business model is built on profit. So that is the situation. What I want readers to learn, the takeaway from the book is that, you know, in the words of uh, Edmund Burke, said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Mm-hmm. And if I may also quote Dr. King, Dr. King told us that, you see, that when there is... Um, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Mm-hmm. So because of that, you know, people need to be aware of what is going on and not show deliberate indifference. Many people are not concerned about what is the, the injustice in America because they have not, neither they nor their families have been directly affected. People begin to take it serious when it hits home, but it shouldn't be that way. You know, we are only the duty to do what is right, to instigate reform in the system. You know, that is one takeaway. Another takeaway is that, you see, whatever we go through in life, it's a learning experience for us. Uh, we can always find meaning in our situation, even the seemingly meaningless ones. So uh, what I learned from this, I underwent a lot of spiritual growth during my period in, of incarceration. You know, I learned about grace. I learned about forgiveness. Forgiveness is a thing all of us struggle with. Mm-hmm. You know, but 
Forgiveness is the only way. Because when we refuse to forgive, we are held captive in the prison for forgiveness. And even though we did nothing wrong, we suffer unnecessarily. Forgiveness wasn't easy for me. You know, in prison, I was angry. Mm -hmm. I wanted to stay angry. But then forgiveness almost choked me up yes. until I decided to forgive. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness, with forgiveness, we set ourselves free. Yeah. Forgiveness is not a gift for the offender. It's a gift that we give to ourselves. So these are some of the lessons I want readers to take away from the book. Yes. And I'm not under the wishful thinking that one single book can cause reform in the system. But we can all do our little bit to make the world a better place. Wow. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. Pearls of wisdom. And Fred, how has this journey transformed your life? I, I can hear some of the values that you've learned through this transformation, but uh, how can you surmise this transformation for us? It has transformed my life because it was in prison I, I received my spiritual epiphany. Mm -hmm. I've always been a Christian, but when your back is against the wall, when you face an impossible enemy, you are forced to seek a higher power. Yes. You, are fa you are forced to you know, surrender to the one that is above everyone else. So it transformed my life. I mean, I became a preacher uh, while I was in prison. I became a counselor to, to people, you know, uh, who were heartbroken. Um, and out of prison, you know, I, you know, uh, created a blog. You know, I've, I do book signing where I tell people about what is going on in the justice system. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've also learned grace and not to be too judgmental for other people. I was one person who thought prisoners were all bad. I never saw any good thing, any, anything good in them. But uh, of course, I mean, offenders need to be punished for their sins as a deterrent to others. Mm -hmm. But in prison, I met many people who were innocent, mm -hmm. just like I was. And it is hard to believe that uh, there's always this conventional belief that the government always acts for the common good. But when it comes to the justice system, you know, uh, in the United States, it is not the case. I, I, I describe the justice system as an evil behind the veil. You know, uh, I'm not meant to be judgmental for other people. But even those that are guilty, also deserve some grace and empathy. Yes. Uh, we need to show love, and correction should not be all punitive. It should also focus on rehabilitation and restoration. So in a way, uh, to summarize the whole thing in, in a simple word, uh, I was transformed, you know, uh, for good, and, and to know that, um, we should not take things in a very simplistic way, but rather we should look at the big, bigger picture and, and be able to extend love, even to the least undeserving. Yes, yes. Wow. <clears throat> it's it's uh, really very humbling and uh, an honor to hear your story. Um, you've been taken from... Uh, the valley to the mountaintop and really an inspirational story uh, for so many. And uh, it, it really is uh, quite um, an expose of, of something that uh, really needs to be reformed as, as how you described it. So I'm intrigued and I'm sure the listeners are intrigued to know where they can purchase a copy of your book. My book is listed on uh, most book outlets across the globe. Uh, it's on Amazon. It's on uh, Barnes & Noble. It's on Chapters. Um, it's basically in almost every single book outlet, about 37,000 book outlets across the globe. And again, the title is um, American Criminal Justice, Inc., mm -hmm. Rogue Prosecutions in an Era of Mass Incarceration. Uh, my new book that has just been released uh, is entitled One Life Doesn't Make Sense 
-hmm. A believer's struggle with faith and destiny. That's my new book, and uh, it's, it's, it's on Amazon and other books, at least as well. Okay, okay. Wonderful. And how much does the book retail for? Uh, the American Criminal Justice Inc. sells for $17, 17 U.S. dollars. Okay. And uh, uh, one like those doesn't make sense, sells for $12. $12, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So wonderful tools for people to have for inspiration, uh, to invite courage in moments of uh, peril, and uh, to look to you as a shining example on how people overcome um, through, you know, leaning towards a higher power uh, through faith. So it's, it's really quite an amazing transformation. I thank you so much for sharing it with us. Uh, I look forward to getting a copy, a signed copy of the book when we see it this afternoon uh, in the TV taping um, scenario coming up in the uh, next few days. And uh, please, I invite you to follow Fred on social media. So could you please let us know where we can do that? I'm on Facebook. Uh, it's uh, Fred Egobo on Facebook. Um, and my Twitter is Egobo. Just a robot, my last name. That's my Twitter account. And I'm also on Instagram. Yeah. Okay. And mm. and your last name is spelled uh, E G H O B O R. Okay. Correct. Well, look out for Fred Ogobar on social media. Also, catch him on the Nikki Clark Show TV taping coming up in the next uh, little while. And uh, also, uh, Go to chapters available in Canada and Barnes and Nobles in the United States. Um, Amazon, I believe, has your book. So, yeah, you'll just Google Fred Egobor and you'll find where you can um, follow him on social media and also get a copy of these outstanding books. You want to have them in your library. Uh, my library keeps expanding. I love knowledge and I love books, so I can't wait to adopt these two books in my own collection. So, Fred, thank you again for your time. Uh, God bless you for all the great works that you're doing and, and the works that you're going to continue to do and look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Have a wonderful okay. day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.